apologies if my voice sounds a little bit hoarse, I am feeling a little bit run down. However, today I would like to give an introduction to universal algebra. In this context, an algebra is a set A together with a collection of operations mu i indexed by some set i, um, each of which are just functions from a k i, where k i is a non-negative integer, back to a. To make this concrete, let's have a look at the additive structure of R. So for instance, on R, we have addition, which takes R2 back to R, taking a pair xy to x plus y. We also have negation, which takes R1 back to R, and takes in x and negates it. Last, but certainly not least, we have something special called a nullary operation. That one is going to be denoted with zero. And we can think of it loosely as a function not of an R2, not on R1, but on R0. And what it does is it corresponds to the element zero as a real number. Of course, it's all well and good to list a set with some operations on it, but that doesn't, but that isn't as useful unless we consider the relationships between them and the relationships that the operations hold. These are often encapsulated in equational laws, which is simply an equation in variables combined using the operations, which holds true of all choices for the variables taken from our algebra A. So as an example, continuing the same additive structure example, we have equational laws, we have the associativity law, x plus y plus z, is going to be x plus y, then plus z. We also have the commutative law, x plus y, is y plus x. That one's a bit more clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have the fact that zero acts as an additive identity, so that x plus zero is x, and also uh, zero plus x is also equal to x. And last but not least, we have that negation undoes addition in the following precise sense. x plus the negation of x is equal to zero, and similarly, the negation of x plus x is equal to zero. These laws capture a lot of the additive structure of R, though there may be other ones that I have not listed. An equational class, then, to add one more definition, is a collection C of algebras A, where for each algebra A and C, the operations are indexed over the same index set, and all the algebras in our collection, our equational class, satisfy these same equational laws. So as an example, we can take groups. In a group, what we have is we have a binary operation star, which takes, sorry, not R, but our group G2 back to G by combining elements in some yet unspecified way. We have inversion, which takes G1 to G, which sends G to G inverse. And we also have the nullary operation E, which we can think of as going from G0 back to G. And these are, these are subject to the equational laws of associativity, x star y star z is going to be the same as x star y, then star z. Not only do we have associativity, we also have that e acts as an identity, so that x star e is the same as e star x, and that x star e is equal to x. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we also have that inversion acts to undo the action of an element, so that x star x inverse is e, and x inverse star x is also e. And these three laws here 
are, well, they're the same laws as up here, except for the extra commutativity requirement that we have in the additive structure of R. But these three laws completely capture the notion of a group if we use these three operations. So this gives a universal algebraic encoding of a group. It was at this point that my friend fell down and I had to... <sighs> anyway. So to give some context as to why we might want to study universal algebra, what it essentially tells us is that theorems that seem to occur in every algebraic structure, like the first isomorphism theorem, do occur in every, every algebraic structure, at least according to the rules in universal algebra. So to pin down at least some of the terms here, given an equation of class C and algebras A, B, and C, a homomorphism from A to B is just a map F from A to B, such that for any operation mu of our t k, meaning that it takes a k back to a, and any inputs in a k, we have that f applied at mu is the same thing as mu applied at f. It's the same as, for example, a group homomorphism. If f goes between groups g and h, as a group homomorphism, then we have that f of g star h is going to be, or oh, maybe I should call it g and g prime, g star g prime is going to be the same as f of g star f of g prime, of course, by the definition of a group homomorphism. To show that this is a homomorphism in the universal algebra sense, I will also point out that f at g inverse is the same thing as the inverse of f of g, and that f of the identity element in g is the identity element in h. So these three conditions together show that f preserves the operations star, inversion, and identity, our nullary operation identity. Thus, F is an homomorphism in the universal algebra sense. So to give you a real sense of why this is important, now that we know about group homomorphisms, we can of course extend most of our definitions to talk about objects like kernels, isomorphisms, and images. And we of course recover the first isomorphism theorem that domain mod kernel is always isomorphic to image. In a universal algebra, we also attain various other theorems that occur very commonly, such as the second isomorphism theorem, the third isomorphism theorem, and the correspondence theorem. So I hope this motivates, even if it doesn't spell out the details on why, why we should care out about universal algebra. Thank you for listening.